Perfect. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Clint and I are excited for our, our third interview now, talking with Dave Tuttle from Plat Tech in Connecticut. And we're super excited. Dave has been at Plat Tech for 23 years or 4,000 school days if you're counting. He, as the department head, is not only the instructor for the program teaching 9th through 12th grade, he oversees two teachers. He manages program budgets, purchasing, inventory, shop floor requirements, industrial relations and job placements for his program. He also sits on the statewide steering committee for curriculum and content. He will not brag on himself, but I will. He generally places gold in Skills USA CNC competitions every year with his students. He's also the program coordinator running an, an fifth year program at Houstonic Community College. He is a force to be reckoned with. I will fight you if you want to over him being one of the best instructors in the country. And part of that is not just Dave's passion for teaching, his connection to his students and his connection to industry in his area. It's the way he is constantly innovating even after 4,000 days in the classroom. So Clint, I'm excited that you're here. Dave, I'm excited that you're here. And without further ado, let's jump into what you're doing differently. Yeah. Dave, thanks so much for taking some time today. Can I can I start off with a question for you? Is that okay? Sure. All right. Hey, you know, one thing that I admire about the way you do things is, is you run your program like a shop floor and you use what you call a performance-based industrial model versus like a traditional academic model. Explain what that means. I'm sure other educators will be interested and in, in, in tell us why that is so successful. Uh I would say one of the normal things that we deal with when we're, we have teenagers in a classroom environment is um, trying to avoid the situation where some of them are left behind. It could be too bashful. They're not confident on what they're doing or, um, you know, the classic thing of cheating, getting information from a classmate, that kind of stuff. Well, um, with social media and modern technology with phones, it made it even harder. Um so I started um, thinking about a few years back, started thinking about um, how I can get past this normal stuff, create an environment where the young kids, the teenagers, say 14 to 18, some of them even 19, um, can start to let go of that adolescent behavior and start um, acting more like young adults. So I just simply started changing the model of how the shop floor runs and um, it's rather than worried about, uh, students that might be, um, falling behind or lagging or, or stealing information from friends. I put all the information out on the table. It's there anytime you want it. The books are out access to the internet's out. Um, when we're learning, we are learning in teams and I'm empowering certain students to take leadership roles. So, um, and like I, I've said to a lot of people in the past, you're always going to have a certain portion of your students that excel quickly. They grab onto it quick. They move quick. They grow quick. And I have a choice of either holding them back and trying to get the others to catch up to them, which to me is lowering the bar. Or what I do is I encourage them to reach back, grab their friends and drag them along. And that's exactly what we do. Um, so I get them to a point where I pull them aside one on one. I encourage them to be leaders. I congratulate them on their ability and how fast they're learning. And I go, but I need to remind you that you're on a team. So you need to bring your team with you. So um, the, the kids that do struggle with some of the content, they struggle with understanding how to read prints. They struggle with just the fundamental concepts of what we're doing in precision machining. Um, they love it when a peer grabs them by the shirt and says, come on, we're going. And they do it as a team. Now, let's face it. They do it on a basketball court. They do it on a football field. They do it on a baseball diamond. They do it on the track and field. Well, why can't we do it here? So um, that's exactly what I do. And I, I mean, I'm dealing with it today at, at school. I had a couple of kids falling behind. And right at the end of the day, I spoke to a couple others. And I said, tomorrow, I want to give you the day to go into the metrology department one-on-one -on -one with this one young, your one classmate. And I want you to bring them up to speed, just the two of you. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm all over it. No problem. Rarely when I empower these young kids to take a leadership role, rarely will they ever say no. And it's a totally different environment when a friend's teaching them versus, you know, the old guy in the room. And uh, so what that allows me to do now is now I can turn my attention on some of the other students that are 
maybe not the ones excelling and not the ones falling behind, but that majority of the ones in the middle. And I move them to the higher leadership role as quick as possible. In a, in a very short period of time, I start to step back and the class teaches itself. And I'm just there as a, a facilitator and for a resource. And if you, How empowering for your students. And you're creating amazing leadership and training skills in the people that are doing well in the classroom. I know in high school, I would have loved to take on a role like that in classes where I was excelling, where I could help others. And you're just really nurturing that. I love it. Can you talk a little bit about um, lean manufacturing and how you're incorporating those principles, not just into your shop, which is absolutely amazing. I, I think over 20 pieces of CNC equipment there, but how are you incorporating lean manufacturing principles into how you teach your students and how they work together in those teams? Um, to me, organization is everything. Um, and I'm not talking about at some nerd level either. I'm saying um, where they keep their programs inside the computer and they store them. We actually, we just recently switched to uh, Microsoft so now instead of uh, they used to use Google, now they're using OneDrive. So I'm, we've showed them how to store all their stuff on OneDrive, and then I want them breaking it up into separate folders. We also have three ring binders, which is their hands-on resource that always has to be indexed in a way. So if I'd say they call me and they go, Mr. Tuttle, I'm having a problem with an alarm, and I'll go, go to the tab on alarms inside your three ring binder, pull it open. And what I tell them is every time they experience a problem, when they find a solution, they have to write it up, put it inside the three ring binder as a reference, you know. Um, so that's just on the, the paperwork level of stuff. In we get into the machines, every student is given a program number that they go by, such as one student, they may be their first two digits of their programs is always six five, and another student's is always six six and six seven, six eight. And this way, when you open up a file, you look at it and you're like, well, if it's 6.5, well, that's Brian's programs. I'm looking for mine. Mine is a, uh, a 7200 series program. So I teach them to organize so they can find those files as well. All of our tooling, all of it, and we have an extraordinary inventory of tooling for a high school program. I have over $300,000 in tooling that I've collected and amassed over the years. And uh, I've had a lot of people say, you know, where'd you get all the money? Where'd you get all the money? I said, it wasn't that. I just protected the initial investment and it built over 20 years. So I still have Cat 40 holders and tooling holders that I started, I had 18 years ago. And they're in pristine condition because I teach them to maintain everything we have. Everything is a large investment. So um, I have, um, I have right now over 240 milling tool holders and probably somewhere in the area of about 200 um, carbide insert, replaceable inserts for our lathes, mini college chucks, everything. So every time I buy, um, what I tell the students is, you need to go to inventory and find out, I'm going to buy some of these, tell me what we have currently in inventory. And I teach them about visual inventory as well. So you should be able to open the drawer, look at that one pocket, and tell me how many I have in less than 15 seconds. I don't need to sit there and dig through piles of tools. So I'll go over and say, look up a number seven drill. They'll go open the drawer, they open it up, and they say, you got 10 to 12 in there. I'm like, fine, I'll order another pack. And um, it makes my life easier. Now, after doing that for three and a half years here, when they leave and I place them in a job and they go into a company and they'll, they'll look at their new employer and they go, this place is a mess. You know, and, and they offer a lot of times, they say, I know how to fix this. If you let me, you want me to fix it, I can fix it. And they're pretty amazing when a 17 year old is looking you in the face in a million multi million dollar company and they go, I can fix this for you if you want. But um, but it's it's all about everything should be in its place. Um, everything should be taken care of and you should never have to go far to get what you need. And by the way, you should always, always have what you need. So it's, it's one of one of my things is everything's accessible at all times to everybody. Nothing's held back ever. And so it just, there's no limitation for us whatsoever. I, I love that you empower your students to become an asset as soon as they enter the industry. It's like they have value as soon as they start. And a few minutes ago, Tony mentioned your facility. Well, we know you're getting a brand new facility. Mm -hmm. And I know Tony and I are both excited to come see it in person and hopefully make it in person for a ribbon cutting. Um, so tell us a little bit, how, how does your school and your program, how do you build the support needed to actually make something like that happen? 
um, every industry partner out there, every company, every employer, every politician um, are my equal partner in this. Um, it's I um, park my ego at the door, number one. Um, and when I call and speak to a leader in a company, and it's usually a graduate of this program from as little as five years ago or 25 or 35 years ago, um, I go, you have just as much stake in this as I do. Uh, I need you to tell me what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And um, I don't let if they say, well, you know, maybe you need to do more of this or less of that or whatever it is. I write it down and I react to it. I, I don't let it affect me or how I feel or my ego. My decisions are never, ever based in emotion. They're always based in two important, um, the most critical customer base for what we do here. Number one, my students. Number two, the employers. If I focus everything on them and not on myself, everything for me falls into place. All I got to do is make sure that they're all doing well. If my employers are doing well, they're happy with my graduates and my students are leaving here with great careers. You know, for myself and Greg and Joe, my two partners, my two teachers, we get to sit back with a smile on our face and say, Oop, another good year. Yep. Next, you know, and so um, I just, I just, we remove ourselves from the equation and um, everything falls into place. It's just not a problem at all. I got the best job in the world. So. I think it's why you're so good at it. So I know that I can say personally, as working with you for the last 17 years, um, Dave is an amazing leader. He's an amazing teacher. He's just an all around great guy. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to call you my friend, not just my colleague. So now we're gonna shift into the rapid fire. This is the fun part. All right. All right, if you could spend a day in someone else's shoes, who would it be? Um, the president. Oh, I like it. I, you know what? I'm on board. <laughs> and then that day, I guarantee I'd make a lot of people angry. So, Tuttle 2024. It's only one day, yeah, No way. No way. <laughs> what, what do you think is the best sport to watch live, Dave? I do not like sports at all. It doesn't interest me one bit. Um... I I would say if I'm going to get into any kind of sports that I would probably like watching is something along the line of motorsports. Okay. Um, but, you know, it, it's just in my entire life, was, when everyone else was playing basketball or football, I was working. I was pumping gas. I was changing tires as a teenager. I was I was just always working. I was just a mover and a doer. If I was, or I was in the garage making something. Or I have a, I have a huge shot wood shop at home, so... If a day like today when it's cold and raw, I'm in the basement making something. So, nice. um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the, it's, and I encourage my students that are in sports. My daughter was, uh, was a softball player and my son was in track and stuff like that. But to me, watching a baseball game is like watching paint dry. So, <laughs> just not fast moving. You know, I'll go out in the yard and work for five hours in the hot sun before I'll do that. Dave, what's the first career you ever dreamed of as a kid? Oh, wow. Uh, uh, building homes, which I did. I did that, too. I was I had a construction company for many years. When I wasn't working at Sikorsky Aircraft, I was building and selling houses. Okay. So, And then in 1999, I came here. I slowly curbed that away. So, But, yeah, I always liked building and creating stuff like that. It was fun. What, what would you say you're most proud of professionally? My graduates. Yeah. Yeah. When they come back to me with their nice cars and show me pictures of their homes and, you know, and their their wives or husbands and their uh, their children and their dogs. And and they talk about how fantastic the job is. And, you know, I make more money than my parents and I'm only 22 years old. And and uh, and I do exactly like you guys do right now. I tilt my head. Yes. I go. Yep. I told you so. Yep. I told you, so. <laughs> you know, and, just and it's just that. And I and all I, they said, oh, thank you so much. I said, the simple fact that you're enjoying life and you're the American dream is yours because of the time you spent in our training program here. That's all the thanks I need. You know, that's why I say it again. You know, what better job can you have than to be able to see them go out and do that? And, and it's the same thing that people did for me. You know, all those people that opened doors for me. So. And then our last question today to close it out, what is the best career advice you ever received? Wow, that's a good one. Um, 
I love that your quickest answer was the thing that you're proudest of. It was like graduates and in yeah. two seconds flat. The best advice I ever probably received was um, don't worry about the things you can't control. But that doesn't mean you can't go after them anyways. So um, I, I learned to, to curb my... Um, I get a little overzealous sometimes when someone presents me with a concrete wall because I'm either going to, I intend on knocking it over. I'm going to find a way around it. Tony, you probably know that more than anybody. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, I don't let stuff get me upset. I don't let emotions affect me, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to work at behind the scenes to get through it. So it's basically, I learned patience. It's don't let it stop me what I'm doing and then keep moving forward. So, and in education, How do you get you to clone yourself? What's that? Right. How do we get how do we get you to clone yourself so we have more teachers? It's funny you say that because we had a meeting here today with some some industry partners and some of our leadership from Hartford. And I said that, you know, my retirement date comes in a little over two years and I don't have to, but I can if I want to. And I would love to be able to um, mentor young machine shop teachers and, you know, tell them how to grab the attention of the young people and how to keep yourself on the right track and how to make winners. So, um, you know, teachers are a workforce too. You know, mm -hmm. you look at all the instructors in our, in our country, they in themselves are a workforce that's building other workforces. So um, if they're struggling and they're not getting the support they need and they're, they don't know how to do it, um, they need someone to mentor them. And, you know, it doesn't, doesn't always happen well in education. So. Well, and it is. I mean, we talk about the skills gap and we talk about not finding skilled professionals, but we don't talk about the gray tsunami that's coming in teaching our skilled professionals. And yeah. it's, you know, the threat is real. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Clint, did you have anything else to add on before we wrap up with Dave? This was awesome. No, I just want to say, Dave, thank you for the insight into what it takes to kind of run a successful program and how to tie in industry into everything that you do. And I want to say to anyone listening, thank you for tuning in. Uh, the series here is called Machine Success. We're going to be releasing an episode every month, so make sure you tune in. We're going to have lots of great uh, information all based around education. So thank you to everyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.